And we're so glad you're here. Uh, we welcome you today uh, at the lake. We're so delighted you're here. Now today uh, is a special day for all kinds of reasons. First of all, Jesus is alive. But today is the day we finish up our study. Uh, 22 weeks we've been in the book of Revelation. How many of you enjoyed our study in Revelation? Let me hear from you. Enjoy that? Uh, it, it, choir, it's been a great journey together. Uh, and so uh, we finish it up today. I, I heard about... The famous Sherlock Holmes and his assistant Watson were on a journey together, and they went camping. And so uh, one night, Sherlock wakes up Watson. He said, Watson, look up. Tell me what you see. He said, well, Sherlock, I see the beautiful stars of heaven, and I see all the glories of heaven. And he said, well, what does that tell you? And he said, well, Sherlock, it tells me that we're insignificant. It tells me that we have Creator God, and and, uh, and that we're just, we're just small uh, in the scheme of things. He said, Sherlock, what do you see? And he said, well, Watson, to begin with, I see somebody stole our tent. I mean, you know, come on. <laughs> so, you know, when, uh, when, when you uh, study the book of Revelation, you miss the obvious. Uh, you know, we've been studying this, and when you get in the book of Revelation, you think it's 666 and Antichrist and, you know, the false prophet and all that. It's easy to miss uh, the obvious to it. Uh, but uh, we have discovered that the book of Revelation is all about Jesus. Everybody say Jesus, all right? Yeah. It's all about Him. Matter of fact, it's called, the, the whole book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of the Antichrist. It's not the revelation of 666. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in chapter 1 alone, we discovered there were 12 different names of Jesus just in chapter 1. So the Lord is letting us know that no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens in the future, no matter what happens throughout the book of Revelation, whether you understand it or not, the bottom line is Jesus is alive, Jesus is control, and Jesus is in charge. Do I have anybody that believes that this morning? Jesus is alive, and he's in charge, and he's in control. Give him a hand clap of praise. That's right. Now, we know what the last words of Jesus on the cross were. Father, forgive them. It is finished. Tell her let's stop. Paid in full. That, uh, that's the last words of Jesus on the cross. We know what uh, the last words of Jesus were uh, on this earth before he left to be with the Father and was going to all the world and make disciples who make disciples. Tell the story. Tell people about Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And uh, so today, we're going to look at the very last words of Jesus in the entire Bible. As a matter of fact, it's the last words of Jesus that we'll ever hear from him until he comes again. So, if you have your Bible, everybody, and I hope you do, everybody turn with me to the last book in the Bible, the last chapter in the Bible, and the last words in the Bible. Should be easy to find. Uh, if, you, if you go too far past that, you're in maps, all right? And so the last book in the Bible, the last chapter in the Bible, the last words in the Bible, and it reads like this, Revelation 22. We're going to be beginning at verse 12 this morning. It says, Look, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Both the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let everyone who hears say, Come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water freely. Father, thank you, Lord, for Lord, the worship, the exciting time for this day, for this choir and this orchestra, Father, for the media team and everybody that makes this possible today. Thank you for them. But Lord, Father, more than anything else, we thank you for your inerrant, infallible word. And Father, may we just see these last words. Last words mean something, Father. And Lord, these are the last words that we'll ever hear from you, ever, until we see you again. And so, Father, burn on our heart what it's on your heart, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen? amen. 
and amen. Now I want you to notice, go back to verse 17. I want you to notice that the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's us, that's us choir, uh, that's the church, the Spirit and the bride say what? They say, come, come. Now, who are we inviting Jesus to come to Jesus? Who are we inviting? Well, go look at verse 15. In verse 15, he tells us who we're inviting. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolatries, uh, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood, uh, falsehood. In other words, everyone who loves and lives a lie. In other words, we're inviting people that most of us in this room try our best to stay away from. Uh, people who don't look like us. People who don't act like us. People who are not the same color as us. People who don't hold any values that we hold. Now, don't you listen to me and listen well. As this antichrist world is fast coming to an end, and you can put me in any pigeonhole you want to, I believe Jesus is coming very, very soon. Can anybody believe that, right? Amen. So you can put me in any pigeonhole you want to, but as this antichrist world comes to an end, as fast as it's coming to an end, it seems like Jesus rolls out his welcome mat. Uh, to anybody and everybody who wants to come into heaven, to get into heaven before it's eternally too late. Let me give you exactly what I'm talking about. Um, when Phyllis and I were, were first married, we were, we were very young. I mean, we were so young, we didn't know where to go on honeymoon or summer camp. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, we were young. And, uh, and, and I'm so glad, choir, that at our wedding, now back then, they don't do that anymore now because of the birds or whatever, we're politically correct. But back then, they threw rice. Did anybody throw rice at your wedding? Back in our wedding, they threw rice on, and I'm glad they did because we were so poor, we ate that for three days. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, uh, we needed that. But when we were first married, we lived in a 14-foot wide, 66-foot long mobile home. Now, some of you here today, you call that camping. We weren't camping. That was our house. That's what we lived in. It was our home. And one of the first things we did as a young married couple, we went out and we bought a welcome mat, kind of like this. You've all seen them. And uh, it's kind of like that burlap kind, you know. Now, by the way, this mat said more to us than just welcome. It was special. This was, this was one of the first things that we, that we bought. And, and even though it simply had the words welcome on it, uh, it said, this is our home. You are welcome to come into our little home, our little mobile home. You are welcome to come here where married adults live and we're not living in our parents' basement. Can I get an amen? All right, you know what I'm saying? You are welcome to come here. This, that's what it meant to us. We're grown, married Adults at 18 and 19. I mean, I'm just telling you, that's what it said. But after a while, you know, you start wiping your feet on that mat, and after some use, the welcome begins to fade. We wiped our feet on the same place, and it began to read well. <laughs> well. Then you start wiping in another place, and it began to read me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when your welcome mat ends up saying, well, or me, how many know it's time to get a new welcome mat, right? Because if you don't get a new welcome mat, you know what happens? It begins to say nothing at all. Not a thing. Now, you say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, here's what I'm talking about. Now, think about it. That's a good illustration of our Christian life. When I'm first know Jesus, when I'm first saved, man, I am so excited that Jesus welcomed me into his family, just like I am. I didn't have to do anything for it. It was a free gift. It was paid for. I couldn't be good enough. I couldn't go to church enough. I couldn't give enough. Jesus said, I love you just like you are, but I love you so much, I'm not going to keep you like you are. Come into my family and be my child forever. And he welcomes us. And I was so excited about that. Anybody else excited about that? I was excited about about that. But after a while, after you've had your feet wiped on you by some hypocritical Baptist, 
the welcome begins to fade. And after a while, if you're not careful, you lose that excitement, you lose that joy that you first had, and your life becomes, well, well, so what? Or worse, your life becomes me. It's all about me. Feed me, preacher. Do for me. What's this church going to do for me? Everything's about me. Uh, it becomes that. And then after a while, if you're not careful, your Christian life says nothing. Nothing at all. You develop that, oh well, attitude, or that me attitude, or nothing at all. Now, I want you to understand that as we finish up this, this last chapter in the last words of the last book of the Bible, understand that, that our last thoughts on the book of Revelation is this. After writing 65 books, the Lord gives us 65 books in the Bible that are all about Jesus. There's this, there's this scarlet thread that runs from Genesis all the, way, all the way through Jude, this scarlet thread, and it's all about Jesus. The Bible is all about how we left Jesus and how Jesus did everything he could to get us back to him. And if that were not enough, God gives us one more. He gives us a 66 book, and it's called the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is all about Jesus. It's nothing but about Jesus and how he rules and he reigns. And at the end of that book, one last time, God gives us an invitation to come to him. All through the Bible, his invitation has been, but one last time, God says, listen, this is my heart. I want you to come to me before it's eternally too late. Look at verse 17. Listen to what he says. Both the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let he who's thirsty come. Let who who desires to take the water of life freely. This word come, that, this, is his, this is his favorite word. Uh, you remember back in the book of Genesis, God told Noah, said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. And for 120 years, as you're building that ark, I want you to invite the people to come. Come on the ark. Get on the ark before it's eternally too late, before you drown. Come and get on the ark. The book of Isaiah says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, Jesus can make them whiter than snow. Jesus himself said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You remember what the angel told Mary on that first Easter morning? Uh, the angel said, listen, he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And here, in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17, he says, what? Come. Let, us, let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Come to him. A couple of thoughts I'm going to share very quickly this morning. First of all, you'll notice this. The Spirit does not say come without the bride. The Spirit does not say come without the bride. Now, listen to me, folks. The Holy Spirit of God, by His wisdom, chooses to operate in tandem with the church of the living God. And so, I, I hear people say this all the time. Well, you know, preacher, I, uh, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. I love Jesus, but the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. Well, you're absolutely right. A bunch of hypocrites are in church. Hypocrites in food line. That don't stop you from buying groceries, right? And so we hear that all the time. You know, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me and listen well. That dog don't hunt with Jesus. I'm telling you, you will never please Jesus by saying, Jesus, I love you, but I don't like your church. I love you, but I don't want to go to church. I love you, but I don't need the church. Jesus died for the church. We are his bride. And the Bible says that the Spirit operates through the church, through the local church, through you and me. And all God's people say that's what Jesus has chosen to do. The, listen, listen to me, listen. The church of the living God is meant to be the hope of the world. Yeah. I know the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. Got a pastor for one here preaching right now. Don't say amen, but it's true. Bottom line is, we are meant to be the hope of the world. You do realize we're his voice. We're his hands. We're his feet. We're his heart. 
We're the ones that ought to be inviting people to come to Jesus. Time is running out, and we need to be busy inviting people to come to Jesus. And all God's people say, but we don't. There are so many in here today in this room, you have never shared your story. You have never invited one single person to come to Jesus. Why is that? Well, I think the reason may be is because of my second point. Not only does the Spirit won't say come without the bride, but my second point is the bride does not say come without the Spirit. Too many believers are trying to do the things of God in their own power. Too many believers are trying to, to, uh, to do the things of the Lord uh, on their own without God's power within them. And uh, in, the book of, in the book of Zechariah, uh, God, God goes to Zechariah and says, Zechariah, I want you to be in charge of rebuilding the temple. The temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And he said, I want you to be in charge of rebuilding the temple. You know what, you know what he said? He said, Lord, I can't do that. I can't. It's an impossible task for me. And you know what God said to him? God said, I know you can't. I'm not expecting you to. And the book of Zechariah is a famous verse, and it says, not by, not by might, nor by, by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You can't live the Christian life. God don't expect you to. But the Holy Spirit of God wants to live the Christian life in and through you. It's not by might. It's not by your might. It's not by your personality. It's not by your wisdom. It's not by your knowledge. If anything's going to be done for the cause of Christ, God's people have got to surrender and be filled with the Spirit of God. God says, I know you can't. I don't expect you to. I just want you to do it in my might and in my power. And then thirdly, and this is vital, before you invite others to come, you have to come. You have to come. You can be here today and you say, well, preacher, I, I don't want to. Uh, there, there, there's so much I don't understand. I don't know enough. Uh, I don't want to come to Jesus. Well, I'm telling you, you can do that and you can say that. And there may be some in this room that will say that, but can I tell you, God's got you pegged. He's got you pegged. Look what he said in verse 11. In verse 11, he said, Let the unrighteous go in unrighteousness. Let the filthy still be filthy. You know what God is saying? He's saying, go ahead. Live life on your own terms. You want to. I'm not going to stop you. You go ahead. Live your life on your own terms. Go ahead. Live life unrighteous. I'll let you do it. Live life filthy. I'll let you do it. But you're going to rue the day that you did and you didn't come to Jesus. You'll regret it. Verse 17, once again, look at it. He said, let everyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. You know who that invitation is to? That's to every single one of us. You say, well, pastor, I came to Jesus a long time ago. Uh, Jesus is my Savior. Yeah, I know. Listen to me. Those of you that have already come to Jesus, I don't know about you, but aren't you a little thirsty? Aren't you a little tired? Aren't you a little weary of this sin-sick world? I know I am. Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Anybody here today would love to long a little bit of rest in their spirit? We all would. But those that don't know Jesus, he said, listen, before it's eternally too late, I want you to come to me. In the book of Revelation, we, we've talked about the great tribulation. Uh, we've talked about the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the vile judgments. We sent a lot of chapters during that time talking about the death and destruction that comes on the world, all with the intent of Jesus saying, listen, how bad does it have to get before you turn to me? And apparently it gets really bad before anybody turns to him. But uh, is that what Jesus is all about? It's what some of you think he's all about. No, he's not about that at all. No, look at how it all ends. Look at the very last words of not only the book of Revelation, but listen to the very last words of Jesus himself. Look at verse 20. Verse 20, 21. 
He who testifies about these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Anybody believe that today? I'm coming soon. Amen! Amen. That means so be it. Amen says, you know, when you say amen to me, it's like, you know what that is? The the Greek word for when you say amen like that while I'm preaching, the Greek word is sick him like a dog. (laughs) Amen. Amen! Come! Lord Jesus, last prayer in the Bible. Come, Lord Jesus. That thought scare you? Jesus would come today or any minute? That, it's not designed to scare you. Actually, it's designed to give us comfort. And I don't know about you, but the more sin sick this world becomes, the more antichrist this world becomes, the fact that Jesus could come and deliver us out of this, that brings me a lot of comfort right now. He said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And then he says, the grace. Everybody say grace. Grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with everyone. And he said it again. Amen. Amen. Hey, folks, listen. The Bible ends with grace. It ends with grace. It doesn't end with the great tribulation. It doesn't end with the Antichrist. It doesn't end with Satan winning, it ends with the grace of God. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. I'm so thankful for the grace of God, aren't you? So listen, why don't you let Jesus roll out his welcome mat for you? Why don't you take your old mat that says, well, oh well. Why bother? Or worse, your old mat that says, me. It's all about me. What are you going to do for me? What are others going to do for me? Or even worse, your old mat that through the years ends up saying nothing. No testimony. No praise, no worship, none of that. Why don't you let Jesus roll out his welcome mat to you? And by the way, I want you to notice something about this. The last word in welcome is what? Come, come. come. Would you bow your head, please? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. What about you? Has there ever been a moment, has there ever been a time in your life when you came to Jesus, when you realized that you couldn't do it on your own, you you couldn't save yourself, you weren't good enough, couldn't go to church enough, you, you tried you tried to turn over a new leaf, didn't work. Maybe maybe you said, you know what, I'm gonna get involved in church. That don't work. All of those kind of things, all of those kind of things that we're told, this is what you need to do. And it didn't last. The only thing that'll last is surrender and come to Jesus. If you're here today and, and you've never done that, you say, preacher, yeah, I know all about Jesus. I'm not asking you to know about Jesus. I'm asking you, do you know Jesus? Has there ever been a moment and time in your life that you have come to Him. You see, He's a risen Lord. He's still alive. He lives today. He's in this place. And if Jesus Himself were to walk in this room today, He wouldn't say anything to us He hasn't already said and what He would say to anybody and everybody in this room today, He would say, Come to me. Will you? You're here today and you say, preacher, I don't think I've ever done that. Or maybe you're here today and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it, or I'm trying, or I'm working on it. Jesus didn't say, get your life together and come to me. No, he doesn't say that. That's not a prerequisite. Jesus just says, in our sin, whoever we are, He says, come to me just like you are. 
with all your hurts, all of your hang-ups, all of your habits, just bring them to me. I'll forgive you. Come to me. It's the biggest thing on his heart before it's eternally too late. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, how do I do that? Well, with every head bowed and every eye closed, well, you gotta, you got to confess that you're a sinner. You say, well, well, Pastor, I sin, but that doesn't make me a sinner. No, that's exactly what that makes you. And that's exactly what it makes me. I'm a sinner, and so are you. And by the way, I got good news for you today. This building's packed today, and every single person in this building is a sinner. You're in good company today, and all God's people said. Matter of fact, I've said this often lately. This church does not allow perfect people to come here. Uh, if you're perfect, you make us nervous. But you're not perfect, and you know you're not perfect. You're just like the rest of us. We've all sinned, and we've all come short of the glory of God. So recognize that to Him. Confess that to the risen Lord this morning. And say, Jesus, forgive me. I pray a, a simple prayer like this. Don't make it my prayer. There, there's no such thing as a secret prayer or anything like that, but maybe you don't know exactly what to pray. Just pray something like this in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I take all my sin. I, I take everything I've ever said, everything I've ever done, even everything I've ever thought. I take it, and I come to you because you invite me to. And I am responding to your invitation to come. Save me. Forgive me. Give me a home in heaven in Jesus' name. Anybody in this room today, you prayed that prayer with me, would you raise up your hand nice and high and hold it up and keep it with you? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, even up in the balcony. God bless you, uh, God bless you. Now listen, we're all going to stand right now. I want everybody to stand. And uh, I know we got a big crowd here today, and so everybody's standing. I want everybody to look at me just for a moment. Uh, Pastor Andrew, I, I want you over here on this side. Where's, where's, is, is Chris, where's Chris at? All right, Chris, hey, brother. Uh, Chris, if you'll be on this side, right? We're just on this aisle. Andrew, right here on this aisle, or right here somewhere. Our two pastors will be here. And uh, if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to do this. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. When I say amen to my prayer, I want you to come and tell our two pastors and say, you know, I prayed that prayer with Pastor Jeff. And they'll share, they'll share with you what you need to do next. Don't let the size of the crowd keep you, keep you back. You asked the Lord to come in your heart. You came to Him. It's the most important thing. But I know you don't have all the answers. I know that. That's what we do. We can hear. We, can, we don't have all the answers for a lot of things. But when it comes to your soul salvation and helping you grow in Jesus, that's what we do. And, uh, and God, God, God knows that about this place. And so we had several that raised their hand. I'm going to ask you to come. Choir's going to sing in just a moment. Because the very last words of Jesus on the cross is, it is finished. And it is finished. You see, you can't add to it. It's already been done. It's already been done for you, free and clear. I know you have a tough time believing that, because in this, in this world, nothing's free. Salvation is free, but it wasn't cheap. Salvation came at a great price, the price of Jesus' blood. And so in just a moment, of course, we're going to sing. But I just want one more time, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask believers today all over the building, from the bottom floor to the balcony to the choir, wherever, you're here today, and you would say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. But I have slipped away. I need to come back to Jesus. I need to come back to His fullness. I need to come back to His presence. 
I didn't mean to, but I let life cause me to wipe my feet on the welcome mat. And my wife is ending up saying, well, so what? Or even worse, my life has become about me and what I want. And I want, I want to come back with a full welcome to Jesus. I need that. All over the building, anybody would be honest enough to say that. All over the building, raise your hand up, hold them up and keep them up. Amen. All right, many people. All right. I'm going to invite you to come. I'm going to invite you to come. There's a little room down here at this altar. You can, you can go through this orchestra or whatever you need to do. I'm going to ask you, those of you that need to rededicate your life to him, those of you that need to come back, those of you that need revival, how many believe this nation needs revival? Raise your hand. Amen. We do. And maybe you need to come and pray for revival. But I'm telling you, revival won't begin in the nation until revival begins in you till it begins in me. So I'm going to play, uh, pray. And as the choir sings, I'm going to ask you to come. Maybe you want to pray with one of our pastors. Maybe you just want to come down here to the altar. Maybe whatever you need to do, Jesus is coming again. He invites us to come to him. Don't live these days apart from the Lamb of God. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that the last word in the Bible is grace. May the grace of God. Lord, you do nothing but offer us grace. You offer us forgiveness. You didn't come to punish us. We already did that ourselves. You came to forgive us and to restore us. And so I pray on this Easter Sunday morning that, Lord, we will surrender to you. Those that raise their hand that they trusted you for the first time, they'll come. Those that have allowed things to happen in their life and their fellowship with you is not what it used to be, they'll come. Lord, move in our hearts. In Jesus' name, choir, you sing. You come.